Well, we will now hear from Kai Man Sang, Dorian Goldfeld, and Brian Conray about their reminiscences of Ate Selber. Um, it's a great honor for me to be here to pay tribute to Professor Atlas Selberg. Professor Selberg was my thesis advisor for my doctoral study at Princeton University in the early 1980s. Occasionally, um, friends of mine, especially Chinese friends, ask me how I got to become a student of Selberg. Well, um, our acquaintance began in 1981 when I attended a series of lectures on the Sif methods he gave at the Institute um, in the spring term of 1981. These lectures took place in um, the Fu Hall in room 119, and a big crowd turned up for the first meeting. Then the number of listeners settled down st to a steady stay of five to six after the first two weeks. I was among this small group that stayed on until the end of the whole lecture series. And obviously, Selberg had noticed me in this small group of audience. But in fact, I was not following closely his lectures. <laughs> they were not easy at all. I did talk to him once after his lecture end, and he kindly led me into his office and gave me a copy of his Stony Brook lecture on the Sif methods. Then I felt that he was a very kind old man. Later in 1981, I think in September, after I got through my general examination um, at Princeton University, I remember uh, Professor Katz was the director then. I went to see him at his office without making prior appointment. I expressed to him my interest in his work, especially on the sieves and the theory of the Riemann Seder function. And then I asked if he would be willing to be my thesis advisor. He agreed on the spot. And that marked the beginning of our long time association which lasts till now. From that point onwards, he reserved every Friday afternoon for me. During our meetings, he went through with me many of the things he had done in the past. The main areas he concentrated in were the seas and the theory of the Riemann set of functions. He wrote on the blackboards in his office and then explained patiently, slowly, with lots of details filled in. Now this was not his typical style of lecturing. 
and he has evidently spent a lot of effort in accommodating my pains. In addition, he has also organized the materials in a way that would allow me to see the flow of his simple and elegant ideas. I still remember vividly the way he constructed the majoran and minoran of an interval, which have compactly support Fourier transforms. While mathematicians who are more familiar with Selber may have heard him comment like, um, I knew this, I have obtained this, um, for instance, in 1941, 1942, and so on. Such comments may sound a little embarrassing or discouraging, but to me, they amount to commendation. Only in a couple of instances that I have been able to prove something that he has done in the 1940s. Our weekly meetings have no preset finishing time. Very often, we end up with coffee in the common room in Fu Ho, or sometimes in the cafeteria. Um, these coffee times offered me excellent opportunities to have discussions with him on various other things, from religions, politics, to um, environmental issues, and even stories of his childhood. He's a wise and knowledgeable old man, and his ideas are always stimulating and refreshing. For the few years I was um, under him, he let me do whatever I'm interested in, and he seldom asked me what I was doing. Well, well I, I enjoy this high degree of freedom, I also felt the pressure since I knew that I was on my own and I have to be independent. I got to know Selber in the later part of, of his life. During this period, he has been very generous to whoever came to talk to him. Many young mathematicians, uh, including Omid Ghosh, Brian Conrad, um, Hang Hua Chen, etc., have benefited enormously from his ideas and help. But I think I have been the more lucky one. I can talk to him for a whole afternoon each week for almost four years. The kindness and generosity of the Selbach family does not end with the completion of my doctoral dissertation. Selbach offered me the opportunity of staying on at the institute by appointing me as his assistant, which was not quite true. He was assisting me most of the time. Even after I had returned to Hong Kong to reunite with my family and to teach there, his help continued. He arranged invitations for me to attend conferences, first to the Oslo Conference, which celebrates his 70th birthday, and then to several other later. And also he invited me for shorter visits to the, to the institutes in uh, subsequent years. Now, um, let me mention one instance that Selber has taught me. I have once accepted an offer for, from some place, but then later I changed my mind. Then I went to discuss this with him to see how 
I can make up some kind of excuse for the withdrawal. But then he pointed out to me that things are best explained by their truth. I have kept this variable advice in my mind ever since. I once asked Selber whether he believes in luck. His reply was that luck certainly plays a not insignificant role in one's life. I fully concur with him and I have been most fortunate to have Selber as my teacher and friend in my life, and I will miss him forever. Is the microphone working? I guess so. Well, let me begin by saying that it was a great pleasure and honor for me um, to be here. Uh, and it was a privilege to know Selberg personally and on a mathematical level. I want to give a few glimpses of intersections of our lives um, that, that show us some of the other sides of Selberg not his mathematical side. I first met him in uh, the Stony Brook Conference, which uh, Enrico mentioned, in 1969. Uh, I was very awed at that time, and, and the first, I remember the first time I saw him, uh, I would stand facing him, but he would always be at 90 degrees from me. <laughs> and if I moved, he moved. Uh, but over the years, over the years, the angle decreased, and it, it, it was only in the last few years that we were able to talk face to face uh, on a completely uh, upfront level. In 1970, um, I was applying for jobs and uh, I was not very successful. Uh, I had some offers at small places uh, out of the way and, and a cousin of mine suggested I come to Jerusalem in, in a postdoc, which I did. And it turned out to be a, a mathematical disaster for me to be in Israel at that time. I mean, now, of course, Israel is, is a center for number theory. But at that time, I think I was the only analytic number theorist in the whole country. And, and uh, there were very few people interested in number theory at that time. There were no Russians there at all. Um, <laughs> I, only, I only published one paper in the two years that I was in Israel. And it was basically a continuation of, of earlier work. At, and it seemed impossible for me to return to the United States at that time. Um, I had a, a position at Tel Aviv University. Uh, I didn't know how long it would last. Anyway, from time to time, I went back to the Hebrew University. And one day, I saw an office with an open door. And I looked in, and there was Atlee Selber. And I was completely shocked. What, I said, what are you doing in, in Jerusalem? So he said, well, my wife has some relatives here. And I come here from time to time, and I'm, I'm going to be here for a couple of months. I said, oh, fantastic. Uh, and I asked him uh, when he would be in his office. So he, I think he said it was three days a week, and he would be in it for the afternoon for like four hours. So of course, I came the next, the next day that he was supposed to be there and spend four hours with him. And basically, I did this for two months, for three days a week. No one else seemed you know, that interested in talking with him. <laughs> I learned a lot. Uh, I learned the trace formula. I learned a lot of his work at that time. I feel I became his student in some sense. And it was just pure luck, just pure luck that he was there. Uh, then he left, but before he left, he said, uh, I'd like you to come next year to Princeton and be my assistant. And that basically changed my life. Uh, so the next year, I, I went to Princeton and got back on track in mathematics and started talking with mathematicians. Bombieri was there at that time. And uh, I asked him if I could come work with him in Italy. And he arranged for me 
a postdoc at the Scuola Normale in Pisa. Uh, the, reason, the reason I mention uh, Pisa, I spent two years in Pisa, is because I met uh, another young postdoc there, I forget his name even, um, and this other young postdoc told me that he was getting a, an additional stipend beyond his, his Italian stipend from a foundation in, um, in Texas called the Vaughan Foundation. So after a lot of prodding, I got the address of this foundation and I, I wrote to them that I would be interested in applying and I got a letter from Enrico and suddenly I, I was making twice as much as I was making before. <laughs> And the foundation specifically said that I should work on Fermat's last theorem. And this was the Vaughan Foundation. Anyway, I, I came back after that. I came to the United States. I got a job at MIT. And I met James Vaughan, and we got to be very friendly. A few years later, I had the brilliant idea of, see, at that time, it, it was not fashionable for a famous mathematician to say he was working on a problem like Fermat's last theorem or the Riemann hypothesis. It just, nobody admitted it. But I knew people were doing it. And, <laughs> and I thought it would be a great idea to have a conference on Fermat's last theorem. Now there's been several conferences on the Riemann hypothesis. People are out of the closet. But at that time, it was a new concept. And I, I convinced Vaughan to, uh, to give money for this. So my uh, co-organizers were Barry Mazur and Andrew Wilde. And we organized a conference in Endicott House, which is a very fancy house uh, in the suburbs of Boston. Uh, anyway, now let me tell you why I'm mentioning all this. It's, it's because I, 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 I called Selberg on the phone and asked him if, if he would be interested to come uh, on a conference on Fermat's Last Theorem. He said, oh, I don't work on Fermat's Last Theorem. But he said, yes, I'd be very interested to come there. So I got him the, one of the best rooms, the second best room in Endicott House, one, of course, got the best room. But I got Selberg and his wife. It's a very fancy house. I mean, the rooms are beautiful. And <laughs> we, we, the dinners there were with real silver and, and fancy china. It was a beautiful place. The Selbergs loved it. They just loved it. I mean, I, I played darts every night with Selberg. And we had discussed all kinds of things. He drank a lot. Uh, a few years after that, um, Gross and Zagier proved their famous formula and combined with my work, a problem of Gauss was solved. And uh, James Vaughan uh, wanted to give me a prize. He called this the Vaughan Prize. The prize turned out to be a copy of, an original copy of the Gauss Disquisitionis Arithmetici published in the year 1801. This was the prize. So there was a dinner and there were a lot of famous mathematicians there, Enrico Bambieri, Faultings, Hyman Bass, Jacquet, there were, there were a lot of famous people there. And Vaughan presented me with the book, an actual copy of the book. So I open up the first page, and it's, it's empty. And I thought it would be a great idea to pass the book around and have, have everyone, all these signatures of all these famous mathematicians. Selberg was there, too. <laughs> so the book goes around the table, and, I, I, and everybody signs it, and then I'm the last one to sign it. And then I look, and, and I see there are like a dozen signatures. There are about a dozen people. But there was one other extra signature on the bottom, C.F. Gauss. <laughs> now I looked, I looked later, I, I actually looked up Gauss's actual signature, and this was an extremely good forgery. I mean, <laughs> I thought that, that it was Faultings who did this. Uh, the actual person who, who wrote, who signed twice, signed his own name and Gauss's name, uh, never admitted that he did it. But after discussions with Hetty, she said, yes, uh, this is the kind of thing Attlee might do. <laughs> <laughs> then I, I didn't see the Selbergs for several years, and... Uh, then one day, just out of the blue, I get a call from Hetty Selberg. She said, you know, we enjoyed that conference, that Fermat conference at Endicott House so much. We loved it. She said, you know, Atlee is going to be 70 in a year and a half. Uh, maybe you could organize something for him. <laughs> and then she kept calling me every week, telling me what she wanted. And, 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 and it became quite clear that, that she wanted Warren to... Uh, 
put some money into this, so I asked the Vaughns, and, and they put quite a considerable sum. And then later I found out she was also talking with Enrico, and they were also talking with Aubert in, um, in Norway, and, and we, had, we had the 70th uh, birthday for Selberg, and that's the reason I was one of the organizers. I think that's the reason. I thought I would tell that story. Um, about nine years ago, Dennis Hedgehall in, invited me to Uppsala University in Sweden, and he said Selberg would also be there. So, um, and we were both there for several weeks, and the day we arrived, I came with my whole family, my wife and two daughters, and we were totally jet-lagged and dead from the trip, and, and, and Selberg turned out to have the apartment right next to us, and we went over there to meet him, and... Uh, my kid said, we want to go to sleep, and then he, he said, well, no, you don't want to sleep. He said, if, for jet lag, the best thing is to stay up as long as possible. And, th and then we, we adopted this policy, and, and, and our kids now call it the Selberg solution for jet lag. <laughs> it works very well. Uh, uh, Selberg talked a lot with my daughters. He, he spent a lot of time with them. Uh, my older daughter um, asked him, about mathematics. She said, there are so many formulas to learn in school. How do you do it? How, how do you memorize all these math formulas? And, and he told her, he gave her some advice, which she remembers to this day. He says, I don't remember a single formula. He said, any formula I need, I can derive from first principles within 60 seconds. So I think that changed her attitude about science. But let me end with, um, one more story from Uppsala. So every morning, uh, Atlee and I would walk to the university. It was about a half hour walk. And uh, I noticed that although he was very nice to my kids and, and was very talkative and very friendly with them, he seemed to me, I, he just didn't seem right. He seemed nervous and he, you, he wasn't as talkative as he usually was. Something didn't seem right. Uh, at the, towards the end of the of the visit, one day uh, when we met, suddenly it was the old Selberg. He was smiling, he was happy, he was talking about everything under the sun. I asked him, did something happen? <laughs> and, and he said, yes, something happened. I said, well, what happened? He said, well, before I, before I came to Uppsala, um, I, I sent a letter to a woman friend of mine named Mickey with a proposal. And, and today I received the answer, yes. <laughs> so I, I knew then that, that he was very deeply in love. Um, yeah, I, again, I, I want to say that it's been a, a real privilege for me to know Atlee and, and a great honor for me to be here. I, I, I'll miss him forever. Thank you. I first met Selberg in um, 1982. I came to the Institute uh, that fall as a postdoc, and um, my friend Omit Ghosh had already been here for a year. And as Kaiman mentioned earlier, he would, had gotten to be good friends with Selberg. And um, so Omit introduced me to him and kind of paved the way. I was a little nervous at first, but it turned out to be a great thing. Uh, Dan Goldston was there that year also. And the three of us um, really enjoyed talking with Selberg in the coffee room and had lots of very pleasant times with him. Towards the end of the year, we got up uh, enough nerve to invite him to go out to dinner with us. And so the three of us, and Hetty and Atlee, um, went to a fancy French restaurant in New Hope uh, over uh, across the river, uh, over in Pennsylvania. And... Uh, I had the privilege, but also the responsibility of driving, and I was, uh, I have to say, I was very nervous about that. Fortunately, everything went fine, and at the end of a very nice meal, the Selbergs invited us back to their home. And I remember that um, we 
asked to see his uh, Fields Medal, and he brought that out and showed it to us and let us pass it around, and um, that was fairly amazing. Uh, and he also showed us his, uh, his seashell collection, which we were very interested to see. Uh, Dan reminded me, I'd forgotten this, Dan Goldston, that um, when we, after looking at his Fields Medal, when we gave it back to him, he kind of just tossed it over on the bureau, and it was pretty clear. It wasn't, obviously it was important to him, but it was not like, um, you know, his most prized possession. Uh, in the year after the Institute, Omid and I, and uh, Alan Adolfson, who was al also here at the Institute that year, and Rod Yeager, four number theorists, all got hired uh, by Oklahoma State University, which was kind of unusual for a department with no number theorists to all of a sudden hire four at once. It was a very uh, creative thing to do. <clears throat> and Omid had the brilliant idea of having a uh, number theory conference there uh, the next year in 1984 to introduce Stillwater, Oklahoma to the rest of the number theory world. And the first thing he did was to call Selberg and invite him to come. And once Selberg said yes, then uh, the rest was easy. Everybody else came, and it was a, it was a, a great conference. And uh, a highlight of that was at the conference dinner, and Selberg stood up and gave a toast, uh, thanking uh, Omit and the organizers, and uh, said that it was uh, the best organized conference that he had ever attended. And that was really very sweet, and I think, uh, helped make us comfortable for uh, many years in Stillwater. I, um, I copied uh, Omit's idea when, uh, when I was first became involved with AIM, the American Institute of Mathematics. <clears throat> in, um, the, in January of 1995, I first heard about this new institute that was being formed by private money from John Fry, Fry's Electronics, and became on their uh, advisory board. And we had a few meetings where um, the, uh, the Fry's and AIM trustees said, well, what do you want to work on? See, the, the mission of AIM was to, do, to solve problems through a team approach. And our advisory board couldn't quite make up their mind about what to do. So uh, by January of 1996, we were meeting at uh, the AMS meeting in uh, Orlando. I was the youngest person on the uh, advisory board and I suggested, well, why don't we have a project uh, trying to solve the Riemann hypothesis? Well, everyone laughed about that and said, no, 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 that's ridiculous. Nobody has any idea, so we shouldn't do that. Well, I got my feelings hurt, and uh, that night I was talking to my advisor, Hugh Montgomery, about that, and he said, well, you know, it is the 100th anniversary of the proof of the prime number theorem. Why don't you organize a workshop celebrating that and, and uh, gather people together to look to approaches um, towards the Riemann hypothesis. And I said, okay, great idea. I saw the AIM people on my way out of the airport the next morning, uh, Jerry Alexanderson actually, and he said, that sounds good, why don't you do that? And so then I got home that night and the next day the first thing I did was to call Selberg and ask him if he would be willing to participate in, in such a conference. And again, uh, he was. And uh, that helped, I think, make the, the whole thing a great success. Um, <clears throat> uh, for that meeting, we asked him to give a, uh, um, a history of the prime number theorem. Uh, so he gave a, a very nice lecture on the history of the prime number theorem. The workshop was in uh, Seattle, and it was at the end of uh, the summer MathFest meeting. And so the, we organized it so that Selberg's lecture was the last event of the Math Fest and the first event of the, uh, the Riemann Hypothesis Conference. And so he had quite a lar large audience, uh, pr probably three, four hundred people. And uh, it was a, a brilliant lecture. I remember him arguing uh, during <coughs> the course of that lecture that Riemann certainly knew that th the zeta function did not vanish on the one line but that his objective was to get an exact formula for the number of primes, and so he didn't bother to uh, write that down. At the end of that lecture, um, he received a standing ovation, which I think uh, is the first time, and the only time I think I've seen a standing ovation at a math lecture. It was, uh, it was pretty amazing. Um, after, uh, uh, after that uh, meeting that was successful, 
I was uh, invited to become the, uh, the director of the American Institute of Mathematics. And I think having Selberg there uh, sort of paved the way to a successful meeting, which then led to that. So in some ways, I owe uh, a lot to him. Well, a lot more, but uh, certainly that anyway. In uh, 1999, <coughs> Selberg and Mickey came out to AIM and uh, spent, uh, uh, spent some time there, both in 1999 and 2000. And I have a couple of pictures uh, from that visit. Uh, this first one here is, uh, this is actually on part of the property where AIM is going to build its, uh, its new conference facility, uh, the Math Castle. Uh, and, uh, but uh, there's, uh, that's actually John Fry's wife with his baby there, Mooney, uh, next to it. We had a barbecue at my house and then wandered over to look at this, uh, to look at the golf course and the, the future home of AIM. And uh, we took a, a tour around the golf course in uh, golf carts. As you can see, uh, Atlee has a glass of wine in his hand, so he's being driven by a designated driver. Um, while uh, Selberg was there, I asked uh, Jerry Alexanderson if he would interview him. Uh, he's written the math people, uh, sort of volumes one and two, and so has spent some time interviewing. And I just want to play a, a very short excerpt from an interview uh, the summer of, of 1999. When he left, he signed a, a guest book that we had at AIM, and uh, this is my last day. Uh, on this visit, I expect to make more. Let me just express my satisfaction with the facilities provided, the comfort of visitors here, particularly the bocce ball game. As I said above, I expect to be back. Many thanks. He needs to go to lunch every day and play either croquet or bocce. He didn't really like croquet that much, but he was very fond of bocce. He had just the right amount of exercise. When I was scanning this the other day, I noticed that it's actually on his birthday that he wrote that. Um, well, we've already heard this. Um, a lot of the different uh, things named after Selberg. Uh, <coughs> the Tala Selberg, uh, we received a paper from Tala at the uh, Boston Conference, and uh, among them was a letter from Selberg to Tala dated. Uh, 1949, and um, in the letter here, you see um, it says, uh, there's another thing, this last paragraph, uh, oh no, 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 sorry, uh, in the, the paragraph at the top, I think you have prepared the manuscript very nice, my only objection is that you have written by A. Selberg and S. Tala, it should be by S. Tala and A. Selberg. So in mathematics, uh, traditionally the uh, names go in alphabetical order, and in Selberg's only joint paper with Tala, it's written Selberg and Tala, and it was, you know, it was interesting to see um, this letter that, that sort of explained that. <coughs> We've heard about his work on the zeros of data function and the critical line. Um, he gave us many reprints, AIM collects reprints, and so we have the original reprint of this. And just, uh, people have heard a lot of mention 
about uh, men's work, here's actually a, a, a scan of a page from Lynn's thesis where you can see what, what the constant really is. It's not ever mentioned any place, but here it is. It's 1 over uh, 60 minutes. And uh, it is absolutely correct that that number could be increased considerably. And actually, it would be interesting for somebody to do that. Um, so um, I just want to conclude saying that um, Selberg was my hero and a friend.